Well, the recording is in progress. This is Andrew Williams, Jr. I'm pleased to meet, meet with all of you here uh, with our Facebook audience and our in-house audience. This is our monthly weeks, sorry, <clears throat> first Mondays with the general, retired general Arnold Gordon Bray and the architect, AIA, <clears throat> Michael Rendler. And so this morning, this is um, May the 5th, May, May the 2nd of 2022. General Bray tells us he's going to introduce himself and then give us a little background about why we're here and then introduce Michael Rindler. So General Bray, the ball is in your court. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, I regret that you all uh, can't be able to, to see my, uh, my mug today. Uh, uh, not exactly sure why. But uh, it, it's okay because today the the principle the the principle for the real meat on the bone for discussion is going to be Mr. Michael Rendler, and and just to make sure everybody understands where we are is in this process we talked about the framework of change. We asked the question: Why was a retired general officer? involved with this idea of change in our communities. One is my commitment to this nation is exactly that. It is, it is my commitment to this nation and the nation uh, that we can be and should be. In order for us to be who we can and should be, it means that we have to make sure that every American has the opportunity to be the best version of themselves that they can be. Unfortunately, the, re, the impacts of slavery has affected the mind of many. And as a result, we have communities across this country that are generationally impaired. And I talked about, you know, it used to be a clear complexion issue of those who were descendants of slaves, but that's not true anymore. Now there are communities, and so I use the term uh, U3D or underserved, underrepresented, disenfranchised, uh, and disenfran uh, undervalued and disenfranchised. And I use that term because one, while it is principally black and brown people, if you're trying to find the color, it gets a little difficult. There are also the M&Ms that are part of this, this culture. Those who don't know that they enjoy any kind of a privilege because they are friends, they are part of those communities. And so in our case, our goal is to raise the community because a rising tide raises all ships. And in this case, it means if we do the right things to help all people, we elevate America. And so one of the things that I'm specifically, we are specifically looking at is making sure that we look at a different way of how to make this change. And Michael and I actually belong to a group that is uh, a consortium of the willing. And we call it youth, uh, it, it is called uh, 360 Infinity. Uh, you, you don't have to worry about the name itself, but it is a group that is looking at the idea of making sure that you're looking at holistic change because the four key elements are tied to a issue that now many call the, the uh, uh, envisioned centers that are locations within cities whereby there is someone, a community leader, activists who have tied together uh, government and private industry so that the two can start to look at the aspects of a group of, of, of young people as the target between the ages of 14 to 24. But it looks at also those young people as well as the adults, parents, and the influencers around those that target group to create the change. It also recognizes that there's an innovation that has happened across the nation and across the world that they must be connected and, then, and that connection means that they've gotta have the ability to connect. 
That means an internet, an innovation net, the ability to talk to each other so that those four pillars can work. And in many cases, they're looking at specifically developing a network that allows people to communicate that is also minority owned so that you, you start to address some of those pillars. Now, what are the pillars? The pillars are leader and character development, health, physical, and mental wellness, financial literacy and wealth building. And the most important element, this is where Michael Rindler is an expert and uh, one of the, entre the, the inventors, if you will, of an, an, a methodology of using the environment as the basis for education so that one, what we learn, we also bring back to the community so that we get community designed around the idea of an environment that uses the study of to address both mathematics, engineering, and other forms of literacy. At the same time, the communities are designed by the community. That's an awful lot to lay on you. But the real goal of what I suggest to you is this. It is that that holistic view is designed to prevent looking at just one aspect at a time, trying to teach children so that one, they learn reading, writing, arithmetic, but they don't learn to be good people. Or they learn a skill or a trade, but they don't learn how to be good managers of their money. They don't understand what that means. Or worse, we're putting kids in, in, a, in an environment where all of a sudden we see them challenged and we've never looked at the impacts of their physical and mental environment. As a former soldier, I understand what it means also to come out of a community and watch when you're afraid to walk down the street. We have a lot of folks who are impacted by PTSD that we don't recognize or call it that. And so what the holistic view is designed to do is make sure that one, when we, when we address a community, when we address a child, we are looking at them for the, for the total of who they are, where they come from, and then train them to help change that environment. So with that as a platform and a basis for movement, there's an awful lot right now that is going on across this nation. There is efforts by the, this current administration and even the last administration with, the, with some of the ideas, but now the time is here. The time is ripe for us to start looking at some of those very specific ways and methodologies to move forward. So with that said, I'm gonna turn this over to the architect to tell you some of those tools, talk about some of those cities where some of these things are happening. Michael Rindler. Yeah, thank you, thank you General Bray. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here with, with the team that we've been working you know, in this space for five, six years now and moved through several administrations. So, you know, some of these ideas started in, in the Obama administration and then Trump had some ideas and Dr. Carson implemented this Envision Center narrative. And now we have this very large infrastructure bill. Um, and inside of the infrastructure bill is this term Justice 40 and the calculus for what they call a benefit cost analysis drives directly to this both ethical question within the pillars and the financial uh, empowerment or what I like to call the equity question. And so this premise of allowing communities to become self-empowered you know, we've heard for a long time about personal empowerment, but if you talk about neighborhood empowerment or community empowerment, the, the narrative becomes pretty complex. 
And so what we uh, are, are attempting to do and have been discussing is to move the conversation to a virtualization. And that sounds like a big word, sounds somewhat abstract, um, but the truth of the matter is, as we're having this meeting right now in a virtual space, this technology is now allowing us to exchange information at a very high fidelity in large locations, small locations, so that we can then really do predictive performance analysis about what is the benefit to these communities by investing capital at the scales that this capital is going to get invested, $1.4 trillion, 40% of that. So we've never seen anything like this in the history of America. And I am very hopeful that um, this implementation with leadership in several cities across the United States currently will start to form up what this whole of community model could look like. So some of the work that we've been involved with in Las Vegas uh, is to actually do compare and contrast between what's going on on the East Coast in Richmond, Virginia, with what's going on in Watts, Los Angeles, with what's happening as an emerging narrative in Las Vegas, with some pretty serious leadership with work we're doing in Kansas City. Um, with the steam village. And, and so seeing that, then we're talking about in the South with Austin, Texas, and some of the things that they're doing, how this can then become a template as we move the ball forward with the necessary partnerships and associations between the municipalities that actually manage the public space with the security metric that is being discussed with how the community is part of the security metric, as well as the universities and the community colleges, so that we can have that pipeline or that pathway across all of the CTEs, career technical education pathways. And so as General Bray has noted, looking at the environment and the green narrative and this whole idea about how nature builds us and how we respond to natural systems. These are divine types of constructs and science is a methodology of investigation. So there's many things written in academic papers about this relationship of science. And I say STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math is really just one thing, investigation. And in life in itself is a type of investigation, but for you to feel participatory in your investigation is where this community can move forward. And so we've been presenting our papers, we've been presenting our investigations because we actually feel that the, each of these communities, Las Vegas community, the historic West Side, Los Angeles community, Watts, Virginia's community, Richmond, um, Kansas City, Missouri, Kansas City, Kansas, have this population that is very capable that we've demonstrated proof of concept to put in place the digital infrastructure necessary for participatory governance. And this at its root is what I believe democracy is in the 21st century. So rather than just having representatives, we have the capability to have access to the scientific um, literature as well as what's called community science. Community science is ground truthing this uh, narrative of activities within the neighborhoods and their association with their physical space with the investigation of decarbonization or the investigation of detoxification. And so neighborhoods detoxification now points to something called the, the public health assessment model. These public health assessment models start to look at people and society in a much more rigorous data-driven statistical model. And with that, then we will be able to do an intervention 
with these projects in the most strategic manner. And that means what would be the most effective and how can we create some types of, of chronologies. And so over this last month, we've been working with Howard University's new quantum computing center and looking at quantum computing with career pathways for this model called VCAP, Virtual Community Action Planning, which is recognizing that unless we have all of the pieces of the puzzle, so to speak, on the table, it's going to be really hard to put the puzzle together. And so um, the thinking is that a lot of these initiatives, such as housing, mobility, access, education, have what are called interdependencies. You can't do one without affecting the other. And so this premise is really the, the crux of what's called parallel processing, a type of uh, computer um, decision making. And getting that into a quantum framework is a new frontier. And we feel that this work coming out of the White House right now, um, the White House Initiative for Historic Black Colleges and Universities can now leverage this concept of building a complete pathway into this digital transformation. So putting the virtualization inside of the neighborhood and having the youth and the high school students actually constructing their neighborhoods and then reconstructing what that looks like in terms of environmental science and then bringing the profession that's actually contracted to do the services into being facilitator rather than uh, uh, the one who already knows. And this takes its root in what's called open source um, data processing or open, open source software development. And the premise is pretty simple. The more eyes on the problem, the more likely you're gonna get a better solution. And so this is being now applied to neighborhoods, curriculum, and getting schools to participate in this and using these kinds of tools is the future of how education can then become always on, anywhere, learning. And then we pivot from teaching to learning. And then the learning becomes the process of how we build out our communities. And that becomes the new motif, if you will, of how education will then shift to being facilitator instead of what we're using right now, which is called deficit education. And deficit education is, um, def deficit education is, you don't know that yet, okay, you need to be remediated. When everybody has gifts, everybody has talents, and, and we have tested this model at Los Angeles Trade Technical College, we've reverse engineered desire, and in that reverse engineering of desire, we've proven that students, once they want to do something because they see their purpose in the equation, can learn just about anything. They may not have the prerequisite knowledge at the point in time they create the desire, but we need to reconstruct how they can get that knowledge and create those competencies. And so that's the model that we're working on. And we have a lot of support from the White House. We have a lot of support from um, the military uh, through a whole group called VAG, Veterans Affinity Group, which is pulled together a number of different leaders, put on a lot of workshops. Uh, West Point is involved in our conversation as well. And I think General Bray has summed it up really nicely. It, it's a mission of the willing, and that's what we're working towards, and, and we feel that this is something that we can discuss and, and push forward with best practice. And then how do you actually mature this? So the, how the model matures in Austin, Texas, will be very different than how the model matures in Watts. Some of the prerequisites will be similar, but the kid that's in Watts is no longer going to see himself just in Watts. 
he's going to see himself as part of a larger uh, fabric of learners in the in this new paradigm. So I think that's where we are, uh, as Andrew said, on May 2nd. And I think uh, we'll be in Kansas City next week, or excuse me, the rest of this week, uh, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, we have big engineering firms asking, how do we do the engagement? Because they're not going to be able to receive these dollars based on the RAISE grant rebuilds America's infrastructure sustainably and equity, equitably without this 40% inclusion narrative benefit cost analysis and the benefit is the inclusion and so this is a methodology of doing that and we're hoping to build the calculus build the lens build the telescope so we can look at this very carefully michael if i can i'm going to step in very i'll ask you to to, to uh re-examine a couple of things for emphasis. One is specifically as you know, and let's use a, a, a Bloom's taxonomy, if you will, of teaching. You know, in most cases, our, edu our teaching or educational process is to give kids uh, building blocks whereby their, uh, their specific goal and role is to learn what has been taught to them and then regurgitate what they've been taught. The education model would take people, take kids where they're able to take what they've learned from a different teacher, a different uh, discipline, combine those together, and then using Bloom's taxonomy, show an understanding of evaluation, and then be able to innovate at the very end. That's real education. And so the model that you're giving them is something broader. So if you can, would you please take uh, Marcella's uh, example? Marcella, by the way, is, is uh, Michael Rindler's gorgeous and brilliantly talented wife, which I'm not sure how he got her, but that's another story. And uh, it, uh, she has a model whereby students come in and they're given a task without any tools to achieve that task. And then they go back and do that. So explain that to them, Michael. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good example. So, you know, what's your dream house? What's your dream space? And then they want to articulate it. So they put, you know, they cut the cardboard and glue the cardboard and uh, start to understand, you know, what space even means, how you articulate space. And they really don't, you know, tools measurement, they don't know how to measure yet. And so then they don't have quote control. And so then you start to ask them, well, what about this? And what about that? And how does this work? And how does that work? And you need to know geometry so you can know how the sun comes into the room. Or you need to know what the line of sight means. So this is how geometry works. And then it, it's basically reverse engineering the thought process of putting something together. And so now they know, oh, I need to do math to do that. I need to do geometry to do that. Oh, I need to understand how tools work. I need to understand how an exacto knife works or, a, or a, a laser cutter. Oh, I need to understand where the grid is. I need to understand these, these components of how these things work. And so we've proved, as I said earlier, and General Gray has given the example, um, we built this. Now we've taken it to Kansas City and we showed them how to use SketchUp. And in Kansas City, they're like, what's missing in our neighborhood? Oh, we want to have a, um, a clinic or we want to have a small hospital. And then they put the hospital together and they know all the equipment that's in the hospital and they put the equipment in and then they know how all of these things work and they've presented this. And now we have documentation how a 10th grader can actually start to look at this dimensionality of their neighborhoods by saying, what's the neighborhood missing? What do you want? What, you know, how does it work? And so rather than come in and make a sales pitch you come in with, you own this problem. 
and then we can get into detail and go further into detail as it, as it expands. But this is the crux of what General Bryce is talking about. The technical term is constructivist learning. You construct your knowledge and that constructing your knowledge puts you in a position of constant curiosity. And I always say, turn the light on and no one's ever going to turn the light off. And so the light getting turned on is a big part of what we can do with these neighborhoods. They can do amazing things if the environment is conducive to them doing that. For those not, not watching or listening, uh, what they sometimes see is when you hear me talk and you see my title, you see a, uh, a general. But like I explained to my son, I wasn't born a general, in fact, far from it. And I wasn't even expected to be a general, far from it. There are attributes that I had that I didn't know I had, and I got exposed to them. My goal is to try to help people who are infinitely smarter than I am to learn some things about themselves and get some tools much earlier than I achieved them. On the other hand, you have a, you have a Michael Rendler who is the, the, the son of a doctor. And so it was in his home, but the piece that you don't get is Michael Rendler came, but was, was raised in a neighborhood by a father who refused to bow to the notions of gentrification because he was bigger than that. And uh, he instilled in Mr. Rendler the idea that you own you own the space and the problem and the commitment to go with it. And Michael Rindler has that in spades. And so you, you get two folks who are trying to change uh, our spheres of influence uh, across this nation to go forward. And what we're getting at in, th in this session is letting you kind of see what we're trying to achieve and then more importantly, to let you know that the time is now. If you are in or near any of these communities and you have gifts or talented talents and or interested because for whatever reason you need, you see a need and you're willing to help, you need to get on the internet, you need to get with your, your housing and urban development leaders, you need to go to those communities, you need to talk to your uh, community leaders and see what they know, what they don't know. And then uh, get in contact with uh, Lady Alicia uh, and or uh, uh, Mr. Andrews so that you can you can go ahead and start to figure out, Andrew Williams, how to, to do something to advance because the iron is hot right now. Learn If you're a grant writer and you're interested there are grants out there to help your community. But what we're also telling you is in a more directed way, start looking at how you can get at least two of these legs together. Please do not do the one-legged, go down one pillar approach because that does nothing. I shouldn't say that. It does very little. And more often than not, when you start going down that, well, I'm just going to focus on the education piece. And we're going to, and we're gonna work on getting kids math or STEM. And by the way, the other idea is we call it STEAM, which is the arts, because the arts is innovation. That is the untapped, unchanged, unrestricted part of your brain that dreams. You have to learn how to train it so that it can articulate the dream because otherwise it's a nightmare. It's scramble, it's dust. But once you learn to articulate what it is you want, it becomes no kidding, a vision. And so we're trying to help people be able to envision a change. Envision centers are about holistic change. And so our goal is, to, is to, just to ensure that you know that there's some tools out there to go forward. And by the way, an internet is no longer an option. It is a utility just like lights and water. If, you're, if your neighborhood, your kids don't have it, they are left behind and you need to be arguing with all of your, your civilian leadership 
to get it and get it affordable. In my world, if I if I were able to, and we're pushing for it now, it shouldn't even be a choice. That should be one of the things that you're taxed for, and it is in the air with sufficient bandwidth so that everybody can access it, and with sufficient security so that you're comfortable being able to get on the, on the internet. Now, that is an Arnold Brayism that is that is not necessarily being articulated by, by any organization or group, but that is a but I've learned that you gotta have it. And if this pandemic hasn't taught us anything, it has taught us the value of having available bandwidth. You know, right now we're still arguing in the year 2022, and I've had a computer in my home since 1982. I was in combat with, with better access than some of the kids who are, and by the way, in 2001, than the kids 17 miles to the east of me in North Carolina have right now today. That is absolutely criminal because it's, it's, it's essential to education. And more importantly, it opens the world up because our kids have to know they're not competing with the kids on the other side of town or the other side of the state. It's a global, it's a global competition. And I go back to where I began. This is about Americans achieving their dreams and a rising tide raises all ships. If we can lift those of us who are the least of us, then we all rise and we all rise better. And then we allow those of us who have greater talent to rise, even though they may have been omitted in the original design. Those are my thoughts. I really appreciate the, the time we've had today. And I now open up for at least uh, 13 minutes of, of questions and answers, either from our moderators, facilitators, or my teammate, Michael Rindler. Yeah, I just, I just want to put one thing out there really quickly. Um, this precision and these tools and what these tools are capable of and, and working in a space that requires the tools. And this is part of why this virtualization is so important because there's a whole back end group that needs to support this, what's labeled high performance computing centers. And so we've written a position paper for a reentry population about providing the numbers that society really needs to operate this sophisticated ship that we're on in this paradigm. And I wanna make that push that out there because it's really about how do we localize our whole production cycle? Because unless we think carefully about our, con our consumption, our production, our supply chain, our equity inclusion, these all are about this term called digital transformation. And building this transformation, it's an all-in model. And, and that means we need to have every all hands on deck. And so this, this marginalization that's in place right now is not good for anybody. <laughs> and so, and so it really gets down to you know, us as a, as a country, as a civilization, to really think differently about how do we right the wrong and how do we move forward with a whole community approach. And we think it starts block by block. And that is something that we didn't come up with. This is supported in many, because if we wanna build TOCs, transportation oriented communities, and we wanna tell people, you don't really need to have a car. And we wanna to start to emulate that model. Then we have to provide those resources within these neighborhoods. And, and it's so far away from that. We have food deserts, we have educational deserts, we have you know, all of these pieces that need to be rethought and redeveloped. And, and it can be really exciting. And I think we can make things in ways and then they become destinations. All, all of these spots along these, what are now called smart corridors will become destinations. And we then can have a whole robust new, new era and I think the resources are all, all available 
And it's a matter of us lining it up correctly and making sure that the inclusion is, is in there and the transformation is in there. Well, thank you so much, Michael. I'd like to, if I may share my screen briefly, <clears throat> I was honored to be part of the Encounter Think Tank. As you may or may not know, the Los Angeles Strait Technical College Department of Architecture and Environmental Design, Professor Marcella Oliva, launched a campaign to involve the community and business leaders with the students and their activities. I'm the president of Five Points Youth Foundation here in Los Angeles, which is only a few blocks away from ground zero of the 1992 civil unrest. Uh, <clears throat> just this past weekend, we commemorated not just that unrest, but also the precursor event, which was the Watts Gang Truce. This was an example of people in the community facing their problems and dealing with solutions from the bottom up. So I was very, very inspired uh, by the work of the people involved, including Daoud Chirils, who I had an opportunity to honor at Five Points Youth Foundation uh, just the, in the last uh, year or so, along with our founder, Diane Watson. However, I'm bringing up on the screen now an overview of a career by designs <clears throat> that the Los Angeles Trade Technical College, the architecture course is being made available this summer of 2022. So General Bray, uh, with your concept and with your thought <clears throat> about leaving no one behind, that really is articulated in what we now know as the sustainable development goals. Uh, these are terms that I believe have to become part of our narrative for our children in the United States to understand. Unfortunately, there is a study done just in 2020 uh, that there is, is in fact nowhere in the United States that any of the states are <clears throat> achieving even 50% of the stated goals to leave no one behind. But I bring this up to say that it was, <clears throat> excuse me, Howard University that contributed to this study. They're a historically black college and university. We here in Los Angeles have the Watts, I'm sorry, the, the Charles R. Drew uh, University of Medicine and Sci Science and Medicine. And I was privileged to have one of those, one of those representatives to visit our location this past weekend with Sir Bailey and Lynn Crandall. We are all part of this encounter think tank. But on the screen here, I have Careers by Design LA presents <clears throat> Green Jobs for the AEC Industry Cluster. So Michael, I'm, I'm gonna ask if you would be so kind, could you walk us through what this means to our community? And for General Bray's uh, point, how does this relate to empowering the people at the lowest level? Because the community college is a place that does provide opportunities for more students of color and more disadvantaged students than any other educational institution. So Michael, could you kind of- Yeah, the yeah I wanna, if you slide the slide bar down a little bit, there's a, sure. a project underneath um, that I'd like to talk a little bit about. So that uh, pocket part that you see there, the little wedge diagram, um, this is a, a study that was done with the governor and if you go online and you look at Beautify California, there's hundreds of these projects that are um, launched across the state of California through the Department of Transportation. And these projects are intended to be local sourced implementation. So this was a pilot project run out of LA Trade Technical College um, where they actually looked at the tooling that's in our VCAP, Virtual Community Action Planning using SketchUp. They moved the files to a fabricator, the fabricator fabricated using laser cutter to do patterning. The patterning is based on the shape geometry of the original rancheros uh, across the state of California. So this piecing together of all of the tool sets, you can see there, what we're doing is we're now putting the implementation directly into the community. And the Nature Walk project 
in Watts is interconnected with this larger project in Watts called Watts Rising we've been working on for two years. And the idea is around that train station, which sits in the middle of the community, that will bring probably 10,000 passengers a day through the community, not exiting necessarily, but being exposed. So this greening of the blue line, this idea of decarbonization of the entire area, we've done extensive mapping uh, with the community about that, which includes uh, a sensor array for looking at air quality control. So by um, shifting by, to the bicycle, shifting to the mobile transportation, the, the blue line, and then right next to uh, that freeway, which is the 105 freeway is one of these uh, implementations, one of these pocket parks. So right under the blue area there, that uh, is a um, an area along um, Imperial Highway, correct, right there, is an area along Imperial Highway that will be a pocket park. And that pocket park can be implemented exactly the same as the park up higher in the, in the, uh, in the flyer here uh, that explains the entire process. And there's a website that's been stood up, Greening LA, and that Greening LA website walks you through the entire process. So these are now implementation projects. So this has been supported by the USGBC, United States Green Building Council. Um, this is a way that they feel they can move the money quickly into the community and the community can then be participatory in the in the transformation model. And there's hundreds of these across the state of California. And so we feel that these are now uh, examples. Thank you, Greening LA, yes. And that is a demonstration project that was done with a abandoned space and a very small budget. And they were able to do this entire uh, pocket park in an area that is uh, deprived of usable open space. And so there's hundreds of these sites that are part of Caltrans, California Department of Transportation, where these, what I call interventions can take place. They create job skills, they create opportunity, they create design process that we've already talked about. And these are now benefiting the community because now the community goes from having a dirt, dirt lot to actually having a nice meditation space uh, that they can utilize. And this can be done in many, many, many neighborhoods. And the resources are all associated with the uh, infrastructure bill and the raise, raise project. So it, it has a stormwater study, it has a lighting study, it has security study, it has native species, landscape studies, and there's partners that participate in this with the students to actually put the, put the project online. Here's one of the things, go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, what I was gonna say, one of the things you should notice, if you felt something when you watched the transition from hard ground and gravel, to sidewalk, a place to walk, artistic design, flowers. Those are actual psychological impacts that dissuade people from, from acting out. And, and you see this across the country because people have a tendency to care for that which is which is good there's a project in my home there's a there's a, an area that's a project in my hometown of Columbia South Carolina and there's a, a basketball park they built it and when it first went in I, I to be very candid worried that what was going to happen did never happen because it became ownership the 
basketball park that we have in Columbia, South Carolina now going on 50 years. The rims are still straight. The chains have remained on the goals. The surface is still well cared for because they built it, first of all, when most of us were playing, and, and I'm going to say it like this, I, I was playing playing basketball on a, on a uh, tire rim where the spokes had been taken out. And that was my goal. And, and then we used some borrowed, <laughs> some borrowed uh, plywood from construction sites to make basketball goals. And I remember folks that came in and many of us were high flyers. I was a 40 inch vertical guy. So I was also a high flyer, but we, when we don't, we wouldn't, we didn't hang on the rim because we knew that if it got destroyed, nobody was going to fix it, but us. And we didn't have the funds to do it, but it was ours. And so the city also assisted in keeping it maintained through normal wear and tear. So if you look at that park at that area, what you're looking at is you're looking at a, a place that ultimately people will also take pride in if it's theirs, especially if someone puts his name or, or they were part of the design. That's one of the things that we're talking about having the youth commit some of their time, mental energy into the design of those kinds of things because that gives you that true holistic and generational kinds of change. And I, and even today, when I come back to Columbia, it's a place I drive through to see if the mentality has changed. And as of my last visit, roughly a year ago, there's still straight rims, still chains on the nets, and it's still mine, it's still ours. Well, congratulations. And it's important, I think, for us to realize that these narratives are critical to, I believe, transitioning our efforts to provide a world for the youth for the future to letting them co-create the future as we go forward. So again, General Bray, I'm so excited to be able to have this opportunity every week to every month to share this with you and to let you know we are actually sharing this on online. So anyone that you want to revisit these conversations can go to Facebook forward slash groups forward slash encounter think tank. Uh, that is actually now has 2000 members and your last uh, show last month has had over a hundred people actually visit that and review it. So there is value to that General Bray. And I do want to let you know that Michael Rindler and I and all of us at Encounter LA are working around the clock to make sure we leave no one behind. So I just want to open up the floor to any closing thoughts and uh, get ready for our next event. None. See you next month. Let's change America one community at a time. Yeah, I have, right. I have one little closing piece. I'm going to put it in the chat here. Um, this is a talk that E7 made uh, with the next generation. Um, Jack Rendler uh, made this presentation at Virginia Tech University. Uh, this is a recording of that presentation. This concept of what collective design process looks like to actually bring VCAP into the narrative um, and was very well received as a lecture. Um, Jack has been working really hard with, with his mom and I um, and we've talked about this. So this is next generation thinking. And I would like everyone to, you know, have access to that and be able to download it and listen, take a listen to it. Because I think it's a 40 minute talk, but it, it really brings everything full circle. So um, that's something that's being worked on as well as this digital fabrication at Woodbury University, um, working on that laboratory as well. So wanted to share that with everybody and uh, you can download that. Well, the great news is that even though you guys have to leave, I'm gonna go ahead and play that for our audience so they'll be able to see it. I do wanna let you know, Michael, I just uh, met with uh, Ms. Badeo this past weekend at Five Points Youth Foundation. 
as you know, she's with Watts. So as I understand it, uh, the work continues, but Michael, uh, the work that you're doing with Watts Conda and that team is so important to everyone else. I'll be sharing this video with them. So I did want to let you know that we're, we're still connecting the dots. Yeah, absolutely. And and they're working with the tree people and they're working with the mayor's office and the, this climate emergency uh, response team. So all of this is interconnected with getting, you know, some, some transparency, some inclusion, um, and some measurability about best, best moves forward. So I think we're in a really good space and I think there's some really positive work going on across the nation. So um, thank you, Andrew, for hosting the meeting and thank you, General Bray, for your time. Um, and I think this is a good recording. Yeah, one, 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 one uh, sponsorship note. Um, Michael, I, I really began, <clears throat> as you might know, <clears throat> with a kind of think tank way before I became president of Five Points Youth Foundation. But it was actually my work with Global Business Incubation uh, in 20, 2000 that brought forth the community think tank I began myself in 1984 and at Western and Florence. I'm sorry, Western and 49th in Los Angeles. And we're bringing that forward full, full, full circle so now we're actually asking organizations to join us in an effort to involve our local communities with this global idea of impacting climate justice and environmental justice by working together in small communities to address the issues that we have, that we face locally, and then share that globally. So we're calling it globalizing the Sustainable Development Goals. Wonderful. But So I'm gonna briefly share my screen and just walk you through uh, this collaboration that also includes the Encounter Think Tank, because we welcome partnerships. And the way that we do that is we create what's called multi-stakeholder partnerships. So at the top right-hand side, if you can see my screen here, <coughs> we have the emblem for the Encounter Think Tank. On the left is Five Points Youth Foundation, and to the right is the Global Compact. Uh, Michael, we actually launched this we call it the Ad Hoc International Advisory Board of Goodwill Ambassadors uh, back on uh, International Peace Day in 2019. And the idea was that we wanted to make sure that we had Goodwill Ambassadors around the world that no matter what they were faced with, if they impacted one or more of the sustainable development goals, the idea was that we could begin then to show our community that, that these values are important. So just to let you know, what we're doing is we're calling it an interfaith, neighborhood, business, and academic collaborative. That's why I'm so glad Lady Alicia Hamilton is here. I don't know if she could briefly introduce herself before she leaves, but she brings to us the ability to reach a global audience through the digital universe, but also reaches the interfaith community. So we are all connected together. I took the time to create this brief overview because the challenges facing the thousand year millennium development goals, now during this sustainable development goals phase, the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic, lunar hunger pandemic, and increasing climate chaos can only be overcome with the support of royal, indigenous, tribal, traditional faith-based and community leaders, working with the private sector, aid organizations, philanthropists, financial institutions, governmental agencies, you and me, <clears throat> pursuant to the 10 principles of the United Nations Global Compact. Uh, I say all that to say that everything that we do right here now is part of a documentation process. And the only way that we can begin to have a guideline for our children is to show them where we come from. So the UN Global Compact member, Five Points Youth Foundation, we're working with an uh, international advisory board. We, we have specific outcomes. What we learned is that there's $130 trillion being controlled and directed by the chief financial officers of the, of, of the major corporations that are members of the United Nations Global Compact. They're looking for data-driven solutions. So what we've committed ourselves to do, and Michael, I did register this with the uh, Stanford Collective Impact Forum quite some time ago, but the idea is to recruit new members of the United Nations Global Compact is free for civil society to join, to balance and hold accountable 
the major multinational corporations. Because at the end of the day, it's not the stock price that matters. What matters now, more and more importantly, is what they call ESG. That involves the environment, society, and governance issues. So the better we can address these issues from the standpoint of the ones that are furthest left behind, including people like myself, I'm disabled. I have been for quite some time. But there is, in fact, in Vision 20, 2030, dealing with people with disabilities. That's important for us in Los Angeles because we'll be hosting not just the Olympics in 2028, but also the Paralympics. So the idea, Michael, is for us to involve and engage all of our communities and let us focus on what we know drives solutions. Right now, uh, tourism is not at the top of mind for most people, but the tourists and people that are traveling are the top 1% of the world's population from a per capita basis. We have to engage them with corporate social responsible outcomes so they have a positive impact on the places they travel. When we in Los Angeles welcome the Olympic visitors here in 2028, there'll be three stops on the Crenshaw LAX transit line for Florence Avenue, where, as I said, Five Points is located, but also where Florence and Normandy are located with the ground zero spots of the 1992 civil unrest. In recent articles of the LA Times this past week, there are people in Los Angeles that believe that the next uprising is coming sooner than later because the conditions haven't changed. They've exacerbated with inequality. So the more we can do to pull ourselves together, the better we'll be able to face our coming challenges. So with that, Lady Alicia Hamilton, would you like to uh, make an introduction or a statement before I begin this video for our audience? Going once, going twice. <laughs> okay, then I'm gonna share my screen. Michael, and I'm gonna share this video that you were able to bring to our attention. And that is gonna take us throughout the rest of this time, the remaining. All right, thank you so much, Andrew. I'm, gonna, right. I'm gonna be leaving, thank you. Okay, thank you. Have a wonderful day. Make sure I add the sound. Okay. Ben told me, I was told to start with a statement um, about where I come from. It's a bit poetic. Uh, more importantly, I think is in deep meditation, a deeply focused state of mind. I interpolate the assembly of lines, surfaces, and the structures that infer the construction of out in terms of addressing how to decipher ecology, decipher the earth, or create a legibility of the earth through computational tools. On the bottom right and left, you'll see this trigonometric equation or geometry, which is how satellites read the earth to create dimensional elevation maps. So they'll triangulate points along the surface. Uh, 
observation science and environment. Our guest tonight, uh, Jack. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming here uh, for our fourth student lecture series of the semester. Our guest tonight, uh, Jack Oliva Rendler, who is uh, currently director at E7 uh, Architecture Studio. And prior to that, he's received the uh, undergraduate thesis prize from his uh, alma mater, Southern. California Institute of Architecture and went on to uh, get a master's degree from uh, Harvard GSD and also the award from NASA in urban design in the Mars City design uh, A lot of this uh, pertains to uh, radical data infrastructure for Earth observation, science, and environmental analysis. That's kind of an interesting uh, space for uh, architecture. Uh, uh, yeah, please give it up for Jack. Please, uh, um. So I just want to start by saying thanks so much to uh, all the students for having me here, uh, taking the time to listen to me, and thanks to um, you know everyone for being a part of this. Um, this is really exciting. You're all part of my personal history now. It's my first professional lecture. So, um, so the title is um, "Eco Eco Computational Architecture." Uh, we'll go through a definition of the what that means. Um, I suppose, um, well, Ben told me, I was told to start with a statement um, about where I come from. It's a bit poetic. Uh, more importantly, I think is where I've spent a significant part of my life uh, in a dimensionless space uh, that spans infinitely in every direction where there is no air or gravity, there is a limitless supply of matter with no actual um, properties from which I can assemble architecture. There's no material like uh, density or weight. It is a pure space distilled to the properties of geometry and geometry alone. In deep meditation, it, a deeply focused state of mind, I interpolate the assembly of lines, surfaces, and points into structures that infer the construction of worlds. So I'm starting with this uh, sentiment about the nuclear bomb when Robert Oppenheimer invented it. He said, I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. Um, and I really believe architecture has the ability to create life, sustain life. Um, I hope to become the creator of life, a creator of life, not the creator, of life, a creator of life and a creator of worlds, um, or maybe be like the creator of life, if you will. Um, and so there's a method to doing that. I've, I've been trying to look at uh, ecology as this concept of a life-giving environment, and then how how does one deconstruct, reconstruct an ecology through computation, through architecture? 
So to start with the definition of ecology as an interconnection between organisms and their environment, um, or interconnections between components of the environment, how they form a system. And then what, what is computation, right? So uh, calculations, algorithms, formal systems, arrangements of information as a formula in a procedure. It's a composition of variables as interdependent systems or equations. Um, so cognition, you know, we're in this age, the, the sort of dawn of AI as the assimilation of information into a structure. Um, computations sort of performs in all these ways. Um, and then I see architecture as an assembly of units that pertain to a whole. Um, so architecture and computation are actually rather similar. Uh, and so that it's the configuration of interoperable components of the whole through constructs or constructions. And so we, we construct uh, these sort of calculations of ecology, if that makes sense. Um, so this is, this is what I'm talking about in terms of addressing how to decipher ecology, decipher the earth, or create a legibility of the earth through computational tools. On the bottom right and left, you'll see this trigonometric equation or geometry, which is how satellites read the earth to create dimensional elevation maps. So they'll triangulate points along the surface of the earth and create uh, the terrain maps you see on the top left. That's a type of LIDAR scan. To the right of that is the first ever photograph of the earth from space, um, which I find a really powerful sort of um, perspective to look at our built environments, our natural environments, and then to live in a certain time where humans very obviously have a great impact on the environment. And then what does that mean for us as architects to have a certain uh, collective authorship over our environments and uh, you know how we're treating the biosphere and each other uh, collectively as a, as a type of terrestrial architecture, if you will, or terrestrial system that we're designing. So we have a whole tool set with NASA's Earth Observation uh, System, Earth Observation Data Infrastructure, where the Earth is sort of encoded into a cyber infrastructure. Uh, GIS, uh, Geospatial Information Systems, was um, sort of uh, began its genesis at uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Design and now allows us to essentially take our built environments and reconstruct them as data sets. Uh, so you'll get location, what's called location mapping systems of every school, sort of hospital, agricultural site, industrial facility, commercial spaces. You get a whole programmatic analysis of what's happening in the environment. Um, and you could kind of categorize and color code these things. And these are manipulable sets of data I like to call it a data scape. Um, and so there's within government databases across um, the United States, around the world, these geospatial information systems are becoming very prevalent, uh, common, some are more private and public than others. And I think they become the most legible way where we become familiar with what are the social programmatic functions of our built environment and what, what are the e ecological functions of our environment also. And when they're brought into a, a digital modeling space, that's our opportunity to engage uh, sort of ecological systems, social programs at the scale of the environment, which is radically different in a history of architecture that pertains to a singular parcel. Um, and this is where I see the future of architecture being is in this sort of larger scale um, consideration of infrastructure, uh, sort of large cultural programs that are aggregated or arpeggiated throughout the env environment. So the environment can be like an exploded axonometric diagram parsed out into these multiple layers and becomes the sort of new uh, canvas for architecture, I would say, where you could isolate transportation systems, parcels, 
uh, social programs or cultural programs. Um, and then essentially what that is, is a context model. Each time we do a studio project or an architectural project, we're reconstructing site models. Um, I suppose I propose or rather see that inevitably we will have iterative context models that are continuously iterated upon and shared between architects so that we'll have a continuously working sort of environmental simulation of our cities and architects will be collaborating within this um, sort of digital simulation space where the city's maintained through uh, something that's going to be in between building information modeling and geospatial information systems. Um, okay, so uh, you, you can cartographically uh, parse the layers of the city into what's on the left, which is this high fidelity map, you know, which could be exploded into layers and then diagrammatically, schematically uh, come in to identify certain key points. Uh, what we're looking at here is a map of uh, what, uh, which is a neighborhood in Los Angeles, which um, has sort of the lowest income and a really high crime rate. And then we're identifying the main cultural facilities within that location. Uh, so the schools, the libraries, the museums, the child care centers, and creating a type of green space that connects between them. Um, and I see this as really important because this is becomes how we uh, sort of address uh, the the culture and the sort of social phenomena happening within an area and the biosphere as well. Uh, there's maybe a certain scope of impact a singular building it can have, but when you're uh, calibrating and integrating 26 to 30 projects within a targeted area, they begin to collectively have impact on the way people live, and how they relate to the earth. Um, and this is also, so you can infer from what I'm saying that this is about architects working together within a shared context model, multiple projects happening and simultaneously sort of in a type of interoperable space. So in Los Angeles, I went through um, sort of some key neighborhoods, targeted areas, uh, color coded in a map, the snippets of, of these areas. Um, and so we, we will walk through a few of those. Um, so here you can see there's a lot of sort of industrial sites and commercial space, um, actually not much uh, housing going on in downtown LA. So it's this sort of industrial Mecca. These, it's, it's on the surface appealing to have a color coded map, the sort of colors and uh, symbols begin to tell a story, a certain narrative for um, exactly what's happening inside the space. So you can see where Skid Row is, where most of the homeless are. Those are all the sort of shelters or community services clustered in one area. Um, this is uh, Santa Monica near the coast, lots of uh, residential space and then huge commercial corridors uh, with the 10 freeway meeting the coast um, and a few few schools sprinkled in there. This is Hollywood, uh, industrial and commercial space and then sort of housing aggregated in there. And so what, what this lends us to is the possibility for, you know, uh, scripted algorithms or uh, parametric computation um, using the computer to manipulate data sets or an analyze existing point clouds or point systems coordinates, uh, key locations and their relationship, how uh, resources and essentially energy is migrating and moving through the environment. Um, so this is a triangulation of all those major cultural centers in South Los Angeles. And, and using a procedural method to create green space between all of that. So you would have a reforestation project of all of South Los Angeles in a schematically diagrammed way. 
And from this 2D schematic plan, you could imagine these uh, field algorithms being projected onto these cityscapes. So this is a magnetic field from Grasshopper using attractor points and repulsion points, create a type of field of correlational geometry that would uh, begin to interact with a point cloud. So there's sort of two, uh, two topics being thought of here. On one hand, we have the environment being assimilated into a datascape, and then on the other side, our ability to generate geometric fields, geometric algorithms that have the potential to become architecture. And um, this is a process that I've diagrammed where we call it virtual community action planning at East Seven Architecture Studio, where each community can sort of go through a sort of templatized process. So it begins with GIS and the assimilation of um, a template of data for each community. Um, addressing their key programs and infrastructures, uh, identifying you know, what are the native plant species, where are people living, uh, how do people move within that space, and essentially doing an in-depth site analysis that becomes shared amongst the community and the community engages with that data set, becomes shared amongst them and is within the neighborhood council. And then that becomes um, three-dimensionalized, and of service to algorithms that with AI or the intelligence of the architect can project onto those uh, site analysis models and begin to do sort of larger scale, more integrative conscious design because all that information about the community is there. The community is contributing to these data sets. Um, they're, having input and voices about what are their needs and concerns. Um, and the, the earth too also becomes a parameter variable and driver for these algorithms to interact with. And then at the end, um, these built environments can be put in game engine simulations where um, you can occupy them, explore them, interact with your friends inside them. And it's, uh, a real sort of digitization of our communities. And then we sort of interact with those communities as an interactive modeling process. So this is what a virtual community action planning laboratory might look like. Um, there's certain uh, envision centers being deployed right now um, from the housing and urban development branch of the United States government where they plan to teach STEM uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEAM, um, to the communities uh, I would advocate, E7 Architecture Studio would advocate um, that these digital tools, this virtual community action pro planning process becomes protocol for how each of these communities manages their development. Uh, so people are working together within these laboratories, making collective decisions and deploying um, how multiple projects correlate between each other inside this space. This becomes the new creative uh, sort of laboratory for the community to interact with architects and city planners and sort of visualize the future of each respective community. And so at, at the end of this process when with some foresight we can imagine each community having a digital twin or some type of presence within the uh, internet and you could call that an instant if there is um, a digital twin for each major city in the united states or around the globe or um, a simulation of a city and we have to assimilate, assimilate and organize these digital twins and environmental data sets into something that's navigable. I see that happening in uh, Web3, a spatial internet interface. Um, so we essentially would create a virtual world that would allow you to portal between all these community models 
community simulations, make, make commentary on uh, each community and how they're developing. Um, and then you would also have catalogs within that virtual world of different architectural studios, institutions, um, their catalogs and databases. And then what the phenomena that occurs is a, is a virtual ecology where you have um, on the first layer portals into these digital twins. And then on the second layer sort of architectural catalog and then on the third layer, resource materials with building materials, vegetation indexes, sort of climate information, libraries of algorithms and building technologies. And all of this can and will be aggregated in a virtual world that we're building called the, the Nexus Terraforma platform. Um, and sort of the, uh, that's, that's going to be the official ecoverse of uh, building in the metaverse parking solutions for the real world. Um, it's a virtual eco world building platform made for architecture firms, engineers, contractors, developers, and the community. They uh, work with uh, to display and sell designs, materials built together and interact in an ecological focused and gamified space. So this this becomes a type of gathering space for people within the virtual world. Um, there will be uh, showrooms where architecture firms can display their designs, sell blueprints. You could maybe do research in this virtual world. Uh, and then there becomes this proximity phenomena where there's lots of design intelligence existing in proximity to each other within a shared gamified space. You could exchange ideas in this platform and uh, essentially have access to large data sets and earth simulations and um, whatever information you're willing to share and your friends are willing to share and have this type of exchange of content. And it becomes very eco driven because the environmental data being collected by geospatial information systems um, is present. Uh, you have the vegetation indexes, the hydrology maps, the geology of the earth, and and um, you're also combining that with uh, high tech tools of tokenization and blockchain and AI, which will have a cross referential system to sort of analyze how these multiple simulations are relating to each other. So it's a whole sort of virtual virtual city where these interactions are going to take place. Um, there'll also be exhibitions. Uh, architects can exhibit their work. Um, you The archives and our, uh, sort of catalogs of bodies of work, particular architecture firms can be uploaded a certain service we want to provide. How do you create a spatial exhibition space within the virtual world for um, architects? And that becomes a type of uh, space that you could draw upon. Uh, firms become global. This is a, a sort of global virtual world platform where um, people can log on and access uh, and see the, the work that's going on in these different architecture firms and see the community developments that that are happening around the world. And, and as we have seen this concept of, of a, a web free internet that is spatial and no longer web text-based is the future. And um, it's important as architects, we have an in-depth approach to how that's going to affect our, our practice. Um, I don't necessarily prefer the term metaverse um for the term web three it's simply spatial um so um it becomes an interactive ecoverse for designers firms and designers can upload their models into the terraformal world and are able to play their work and simulations um there could be a strategic partnership and collaboration within this virtual world. Um, 
and and then there becomes this incentivized means to share work and become cooperative within uh, this sort of project to essentially do the ecological restoration of the planet. Um, so uh, local residents will be able to learn about infrastructure of their cities via digital twin simulations, build their own structures on tokenized land plots using assets provided in the platform. Uh, gamified tools and simulations would help teach and inspire architecture students or those considering the profession. Uh, virtual community action planning and similar integrations are planned for subsequent phases of the world function expansion. Um, so I, as, as I was uh, conceptualizing this virtual world um, over the course of the past, let's say eight months, six months, well, I found that the method of constructing a virtual world and what might be the method of constructing a world in uh, sort of an environment space in any major city would be slightly similar. Uh, topography as topology as a sort of parametric equation could be scripted and landscapes could be generated on which you could build a virtual world just like in um, the actual physical world you could have a dimensional elevation map of a city so you can use erosion algorithms this is not a real landscape this is a this is an algorithmically generated by landscape in um a program called Gaia quad spinner um and um i i find i find this sort of paradigm of algorithms being collaged or assimilated or interacting in certain ways very promising um and it, what's also interesting is you could uh draw in a type of procedural way where you're working through a procedure which is like a process which is like a method of calculation so within a, a perspectival grid space um these striations of lines are projected off the grid and then become interrelated or interpolated between each other. And so the relationship of landscape to these geometries um, becomes very powerful. Abstract geometry, I believe, becomes the tool in which we manage complexity, sort of drawing these uh, fields that have an underlying system that governs the way in which these geometries first and aggregate. Um, if we're going to do environmental scale design, we have to do sort of tool-based or or sort of formulas um uh, essentially methods in which we have control over multiple layers of complexity and how those layers relate to each other and become three-dimensional um so these are um sort of cubic systems that are aggregating uh assimilating themselves to create a plant or massings for buildings uh schematically over the landscape you could use multiple types of field algorithms organized like a constellation in a point cloud how multiple buildings would be configured uh in relationship to each other based on axes um if you look at very ancient architecture Tetsu of Khan, Angkor Wat or sort of throughout um human history axes and the sort of alignment and ob of objects within space is Sort of the main means in which we organize our cities. So if we're using algorithms to schematically diagram um, relationships of points and volumes and enclosures, that's the way in which we could build virtual worlds and um, cities as well. Um, so those become the underlying organizational system on which we can place uh, buildings and design. Uh, so this this structure uh, is um, a geospatial repository. Um, it's where within the Nexus Terraforma you would be able to organize and simulate digital twins. Uh, so each rung, like on a bicycle spoke, you'd have a different portal into a different city on planet Earth or a different community in a different part of the world. And within this sort of dial, like a 
a compass or an atlas, you would be able to navigate the multiple simulations of the earth and sort of portal between them and have this type of library where you could access um, the earth system information. And along each spoke would be an exhibition or a gallery space which would give you information that pertains to uh, that given area. Um, and so this is occupied within the virtual world, massive structure. Um, inside of it would be something like this with, you would have your sort of robot avatar to be a little more playful. Um, and then be able to navigate between multiple maps and holograms of these different earth simulations and at the end have a type of green screen portal into different environments. Um, and so this, this one structure that assimilates uh, earth system data would be in context with other structures as well. Um, so then uh, certain points I've been making about um, geometry and morphology be distilled into sort of geometric systems often found in crystallography, uh, which, which allow us to manage complexity and the method in which certain geometric systems or architectures grow and evolve. Um, so as you can see, I'm sort of oscillating both between the virtual world and the um, sort of real life architecture uh, by using abstract geometry, which has a certain potential within it to become many things. Um, without so much being attached to what it is quite yet. And, and uh, being very excited about and acknowledging the potential of geometry to become many things. If you look at many of the, uh, the Taj Mahal or churches around the world, uh, they use construction geometry. And uh, even in deconstructivism, uh, descriptive geometry was the means to arrive at architectural form. So abstract geometry before material is a very legitimate way to arrive at architecture. And in crystallography, what you have is sort of axes of symmetry that can be categorized, uh, color-coded, um, certain radial schemes that can be offset from each other or instead of on each other. Um, and what you find is that a lot of architecture is made this way, but still is biology, meant sort of cellular subdivision of biology and crystallography as well. Um, so I did a series of explorations on what could be um, this, this sort of architectonic morphological language that you arrive at from these uh, schematic geometries. Uh, which are continuously adapting, mutating, um, evolving into different forms based off the sort of tectonic system that follows the geometry. Uh, so, so from that underlying grid, there's seemingly an infinite amount of possibility of forms you could generate between uh, sort of snowflakes or crystals or me uh, mechatronic forms. And then following these sort of New, new forms of um, mathematical geometries all the way through into sort of fractal algorithms and how they create a type of sacred space. And uh, sacred space as derived from sacred geometry or algorithmic forms become, I, I think, sort of the, the apex of these computational designs. If you look at the, the, the Taj Mahal or um, any of these really robust sacred spaces, they use underlying mathematical forms traditionally to, to govern their assembly. And computation is only going to enable us in a deeper way to use those sort of formulations. Um, so I have some uh, animations for you. Um, so this is, oops, I opened this up.
okay, we could start that over. No one got to see it. Um, so these these algorithms, like I was previously saying, have an infinite potential to become many forms, many ways of subdividing, multiplying, and iterating upon themselves. And it, it's sort of restricted to this ambiguous fractal software right now, but I see this only as sort of the, the dawn of something really amazing where we can use mathematical formulas to um, maybe grow architecture or um, see how it might assimilate itself in relationship to the data scape if it's all being calculated. And it's all very um, sort of surreal. But what, I, what I'm discovering in these fractal spaces is a type of way where each component has a relationship with the whole. There's no transformation happening on any scale that doesn't affect in repercussions the entirety of the system. And if we're thinking about this on environmental scale, that becomes a really powerful sentiment that sort of nothing, nothing changes without impacting the whole. Um, of course, those are abstract terms. Um, and as you'll sort of see in later, I'm sort of planning on what, what these structures might look like as uh, sort of built architecture, um, translating these meshes into um, a, 3D, a 3D model that could be built from. Um, that's sort of hinting towards the future of what I plan on exploring right now. They are uh, simply digital illustrations or simulations of potential architecture. Um, so even before I discovered this fractal software, I was trying to emulate how these crystalline algorithms could become architecture, uh, but simply doing it manually, going in and modeling each column and uh, arriving at the most complex tectonic uh, one, one could have where there's this sort of underlying system uh, governing the entirety of the building. Um, so this cathedral project um, sort of tackled the idea of how you would create an architecture from these underlying fractal geometries, and what is the, what is what impact does that have in terms of how you feel inside the space? Um, what what's the sort of material phenomena, and um, what type of um, impact does that have? on your peace of mind and the wellness of your heart. And then later discovering within sort of the fractal landscape, how these forms can be generated in alternative ways where I'm not modeling every column in a manual way, but using a mathematical formula that black box actually hidden within the software to generate these patterns and arriving at these incredible sort of vistas um large expansive environments that are entirely generated by formulas um and then currently um postulating predicting that between the ability to calculate and simulate mathematical formulas like this but then also as you saw at the beginning of the lecture assimilate the earth in a type of computational environment, um, simulating it as LIDAR scans or geospatial maps. Um, we're, we're arriving at a, a sort of different sort of paradigm of computational architecture that's both environmental parametric, and parametric, also algorithmic. Um, so definitely at the fringes of uh, What's, what's actually happening versus in practice versus what's being explored. These sort of fractal algorithms can be uh, 
assimilated into modules and sort of mold uh, components that could be uh, assembled assembled into a house. Or I'm still exploring the potential of these forms, um, bringing them out of the fractal software uh, and into the more traditional modeling software. Um, I find I find that these forms are provocative to display a certain capacity of the computer that may not have been discovered yet, uh, to create a certain type of pattern and cohesion that just and level of complexity that just hasn't been found before. Um, and on multiple scales, either at, at the scale of the ornament or at the scale of what something that looks infrastructural like a metabolist architecture in Japan. Um, and so uh, as a sort of case study, I plan on building a physical model um, of sort of this algorithmic terrain and sort of uh, fractal building. This I see as a monastery um, in a desert. Uh, and the specifics have yet to be clearly articulated. I don't want to improvise too much during this lecture, but this is this is sort of hinting at what I'm going to do in the near future is build build something like this. And that's that's the end of my lecture. And I appreciate you guys also listening so much. And I'm I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. Yeah, um, maybe I could uh, con contrast it with uh, the word ecology. Um, ecology, I see as like uh, sort of agents interacting with each other, individual organisms having their own sense of uh, agency, and then they sort of interact with each other in a type of agent-based way or actor-based way. So sorry, but I see environment as this sort of surrounding the term environ as the surround. So when we generate these uh, context models, it's, it's what's surrounding the architecture. And I find this relationship of the agent within the environment, sort of the, the architecture's relationship with the context, really amazing and sort of oscillating between that, that the relationship of individuals or the relationship of individual agents within the ecology and their surroundings. Yes. So can we, can we talk about that structure that has a total specific uh, and you mentioned the app on the uh, you also mentioned the word like I was wearing at the moment is it uh, is it uh, like yeah the act of in this world or is it like the Kind of all comes to like equality of access to this data. What's most important? Uh, to what it has to be mm -hmm. data. Um, a, a couple of things come to mind. What what might be um immediately more enticing is that these digital twins are a gamified space, so it's the game engine simulation, and it's not going to be a sort of a uh, LIDAR scan like Google Earth. It, and you could travel there with your friends also. So it becomes this kind of interactive way. And if these models are being developed by the community, then it becomes sort of a multi-layered information rich simulation that you're diving into that's that's not just graphic and not just surface level, but has actual uh, like rich attributes of information. There's also, I know, um, you know, in, in these sort of developing communities, people don't have much access to transportation. So this is their opportunity to explore and interact with environments they just don't normally have access to. Um, and also, um, yeah, I think, I think it's an opportunity to sort of uh, have a community space. Uh, I see people 
interacting with their avatars within this um, within this structure. Um, also, I think people want to have agency. If uh, there's so many voices who would love to voice their opinion about what they want to see in their community, and if there is a place where you could maybe portal in and leave a comment or even adjacent to the portal, leave a proposal. Um, there's so many students creating designs right now that don't, those designs don't get used. They just end up in the kind of uh, deep archive of the internet and no one sees them. Um, but maybe if they're in prox, if you're making uh, community specific proposals, um, right, then uh, you, you might have a solution for your neighborhood and someone can see that, um, invest in it and support it. Or you could simply say, I want this person to bring in this type of transformation. Uh, so hopefully we build some type of interface where people are adding, that, adding to the data sets and within this structure contributing to uh, those different portals and what's being presented around them, like in like in this space where multiple avatars are sort of making comments and interacting with it, um, it really becomes collective and everybody having access to this these simulations and having a commentary that surrounds it. Maybe you could even call it like a, a different discourse that happens within this space that that the community starts having within the virtual world. I think that's empowering too. It empowers the community to, um, when they have agency, therefore step up to the plate with, with an opportunity to have impact. Which is anyone, is there other questions? Uh, I want, I'll get to everyone. So. <laughs> you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So this is the virtual community action planning sort of process. It's a great question. I appreciate the question because it's 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 at, it's at what what point within the design process can the community get involved? And I think it's at all 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 of these sort of phases. Like at each one you mentioned, I wouldn't exclude any of them. But um, if if there's a certain protocol within the laboratory uh, to um, do an environmental analysis uh, and people are contributing to that data, that's a place for agency. If there is an identification of key locations, cultural locations, sort of what's happening within the city, that's a place for agency for the community to voice or where, where's the apex of the problem set within the area. Um, and then choosing what, what data is being feeded into an algorithm that that's also where agency happens. And then simply uh, entering into the game space and communicating with your fellow uh, community members within your own community and simply talking about um, what's happening there. Um, art and architecture always has a culture surrounding it. And that's sort of where the magic happens is everyone's talking with each other and making decisions that way. So hopefully this provides certain catalysts for that. And you, you had a question? Yeah. 
this one? Oh, um, yeah. Do you have an idea? Um, it's easier than it seems. I'll say. <laughs> um, it's it's a pro it's a software called Mandible three D, and they have preset formulas that you use. I only use about seven formulas, about eight parameters per formula, and you could the software allows you to stitch together the formulas. You simply keyframe uh, certain moments of the parameter settings. So you could have maybe uh, sort of different, like six different settings and animate between those changing settings. Um, it's a mysterious software to me. I definitely see it. Uh, what I would like to see if I were to speculate sort of a procedure with this software would be how geospatial technology relates to these uh, fractal meshes and how we, we can sort of uh, let um, these formulas disperse themselves on onto the landscapes in a type of intelligent way based off data we feed it. Um, an idea. Yeah, Mandelbulb 3D, yeah. Sorry, it took so long to get to you. Um, I usually I say art, I would rather not define architecture, but simply explore its capacities. Right, and say that an architect can only do this, or a landscape architect can only do that, and then really say that there's a certain we we should be always expanding the scope of impact, and and also give agency to everyone as seeing them as having the potential to contribute. Um, so these these are new tools. There's a history of new geometer tools across, like, um, but I think that. The, the main statement about what's the new role of the designer is when we have tools to simulate environments and ecologies that we become re responsible to interact with those data sets. Um, we, we become a certain transparency about what these environmental and ecological models tell us, we become responsible to uh, respond to those data sets and those narratives of what's happening at, at the level of the biosphere and in the community, those things can no longer be neglected and ignored. Um, and, and your design process, if documented on a blockchain, is going to have a ledger or some type of method in which you say, I, I included these parameters, I included these variables, and this is how I was sensitive to the situation of the environmental environmental model because there's lots of projects that happen colonially or uh, from top-down design where there's large budgets and not much impact happens so if we have a, a, a simulation that's documenting how uh, these community impact projects are being deployed then there's a certain responsibility involved I, I would like to say that the designer, with, with what I've talked about, how the design, the agency of the designer changes, they become, and to use the question, they become environmental. They're concerned with their surroundings. How is this affecting the culture? How is this affecting um, sort of the, the living beings in that site? How, how is this looked at in a type of holistic way where the targeted area is a holistic problem and it's not one building that doesn't consider the impact on the surrounding. Um, and how also it, it gets the designers to work together when you use a shared context model, how do multiple projects communicate with each other and sort of create a symbiotic relationship where they're uh, co-functioning, relating to each other, sort of having multiple as you think of schools and parks having simultaneous purposes or museums, libraries, and 
schools having almost simultaneous purpose for a type of reforestation and affordable housing project. I, I hope that by visualizing codependency within data scape, um, we, 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 could, we could have that different sort of agent um, where we're working together to sort of solve problems holistically and in a sort of integrated way. Um, the, the environmental degradation and the social degradation you see across these, I mean, they're an entangled problem. It's just the same thing, they're not separate things. And so these affordable housing projects, these greenification projects, um, all these really great uh, community development projects that are happening sort of in isolated spaces can be integrated within a shared virtual tool set. And that's everyone working together on environmental And the environment becomes the subject on which you could think of career technical education or multiple uh, sort of career avenues converging on this uh, model simulation space. So if you're studying botany, if you're studying materials, if you're studying genetic engineering, if you're studying sociology, it's, it's, you can a context model and sort of have those data sets stack on uh, sort of one subject, which is the targeted area. Oh, thank you so much for joining us. <clears throat> this is Andrew Williams Jr. Again, this is uh, <clears throat> our first Mondays with the general, retired general Arnold Gordon Bray and the architect, Michael Rendler. Uh, we're streaming this live to Facebook on the Ayagaba network, or you can find us at Facebook forward slash groups forward slash encounter think tank. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back again the first Monday of next month. Have a fantastic day.